So today I'm wearing my awesome new calculus shirt. Thank you to Black Pen Red Pen for sending this to me. And we are going to do this awesome calculus problem. The limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n squared times 1 plus 2 over n squared times 1 plus 3 over n squared and so on up to 1 plus n over n squared. Now the first thing that I notice about this limit is that it's an infinite product and it looks very similar to another limit that we know, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. We know this limit is equal to e by definition. But we could also write this 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n, if we expand out the power, as 1 plus 1 over n times 1 plus 1 over n, and so on, 1 plus 1 over n, and then we would have n of these multiplied together. Maybe there's some way that we can take this limit we have here and make it look like this. If we make it look like this, then we can write it in terms of e, and the problem is solved. So let's take a look at our limit and see what we can do here. The first thing I notice is that this term on the right, 1 plus n over n squared, is actually already equal to 1 plus 1 over n. But that's not true of any of the other terms. For example, 1 plus n minus 1 over n squared, well, that would be 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 over n squared, just by splitting up this fraction here. And then the next factor that we would get, 1 plus n minus 2 over n squared, we could write as 1 plus 1 over n minus 2 over n squared. And then the next one would be minus 3 over n squared, minus 4 over n squared, and so on. Now the question is, what can we do with this information to make our limit look more like the limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n? Because that's the one we know how to deal with. And here's the key insight that leads us to being able to solve this problem. What happens if we look at the factors at the beginning along with the factors at the end? So we could look at 1 plus 1 over n squared and then 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 over n squared. Or we could look at 1 plus 2 over n squared and 1 plus 1 over n minus 2 over n squared. Or more generally, if we look at 1 plus x over n squared times 1 plus 1 over n minus x over n squared. What happens when we multiply these two together? What happens when we multiply these two, multiply these two? What do we get each time? Well, let's see what happens if we expand this out. First, if we just look at this 1 at the left, we get 1 plus 1 over n minus x over n squared. Then we get plus x over n squared plus x over n cubed minus x squared over n to the fourth, just multiplying these out. And then we see plus x over n squared minus x over n squared. Those are going to cancel. And we get 1 plus 1 over n plus x over n cubed minus x squared over n to the fourth. Now let's see what happens if we rewrite our entire limit in terms of this. Notice that in this case we're taking terms at the start and the end, so we're multiplying two together. And the question is how many of them will we have at the, in the final result? Well clearly if we're taking n terms to begin with, 1, 2, 3 up to n on the top, and then we're combining two at a time, we're going to be left with half as many terms. So we're going to have n over 2 of these terms right here. Let's see what that looks like. We get the limit as n approaches infinity of, well, we're going to have this for all x's going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to halfway, which means up to n over 2. So we'll have 1 plus 1 over n. And then when we have x being 1, we'll get plus 1 over n cubed minus 1 over n to the fourth. And then we'll have 1 plus 1 over n plus 2 over n cubed minus 4 over n to the fourth. And then that will keep going. And then our last term will be 1 plus 1 over n plus n over 2 divided by n cubed will be 1 half over n squared. And then minus, if we do n over 2 squared divided by n to the fourth, that's going to be over n squared on the bottom. And then we have 1 fourth on the top. Now at first it looks like we've changed the problem without really simplifying it at all. I mean we do have this 1 plus 1 over n to start, but look at all these other random terms flying out of our multiplication. How are we going to get rid of those? Well the answer lies in some kind of variation of the squeeze theorem. We know that if we want to find, for example, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x, we know that 
we could evaluate this limit directly, but sometimes that's kind of annoying. So another thing we can do is say, well, sine of 1 over x is always going to be between negative 1 and 1. So this limit will always be between the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared and the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x squared. And we know those two graphs are going to meet at 0 when x equals 0. So without evaluating it directly, we can say, well, this has to be equal to 0 because the upper bound and the lower bound of our limit are both going to meet at the same place. We're going to use the same strategy with this limit. When we look at our limit here, what we see in each factor is something that is less than 1 over n squared. So 1 over n cubed, as n gets really big, clearly is smaller than 1 over n squared. 2 over n cubed is also smaller. And then what we have here, our biggest term, is still 1 fourth over n squared in total. So we know this limit, all of these factors are going to be less than 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. So we can say that this limit, if we call our original limit L, we can say L is less than or equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. And then remember, we have n over 2 of these factors. So we know our limit is less than or equal to this. Is our limit greater than or equal to anything? Because if we have something that our limit is bigger than, now we have a way that we can completely bound the result we get. And there is an answer here, which is we say L is greater than or equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n over 2. Because all these error terms, we know whatever they are, they're going to be greater than 0. They're going to be positive, because 1 over n cubed is always going to be bigger than 1 over n to the fourth. 2 over n cubed is bigger than 4 over n to the fourth as n approaches infinity. So we can use these two limits. If we find these limits, and they both end up being the same result, then we can conclusively say that our final limit is equal to that result. So that's the final step in figuring out this limit. So I've cleared the board a little bit, and it's time for us to evaluate each of these limits one by one. Let's start out with this first one right here. We want the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared to the power of n over 2. We want to call this limit something so that we can take the logarithm on both sides. We already used the letter L, so let's call this limit A. If we take the natural log on both sides, that's going to let us take this power out to the front and make this limit easier to deal with. So the natural log of a is going to be equal to the natural log of this limit. But we know the natural log of a limit is the same as the limit of the natural log. So we can bring this natural log to the inside. Natural log of this whole thing, well, we know that if we have the natural log of something to a power, we can bring the power to the front as well. So we get n over 2 times the natural log of 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. So we have this limit right here. What we want to do now is we notice that we have n over 2. As n approaches infinity, that's going to go to infinity. The natural log of this, as n approaches infinity, these are going to go to 0. So we get the natural log of 1, which is 0. So this is a infinity times 0 situation, which means we want to bring one of these two things to the bottom, to the denominator, and then use L'Hopital's rule. So let's try that out. The limit as n approaches infinity, well, we can leave the natural log on top, 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. And then on the bottom, we'll write this n as 1 over n to the negative first power. Now we have natural log of 1 is 0, and then 1 over infinity is also 0. So this is 0 over 0, which means we can use L'Hopital's rule. So we get the limit as n approaches infinity of, if we differentiate the top, we're going to get First, divide by 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. And then by the chain rule, on the top here, we're going to get negative 1 over n squared minus 2 over n cubed. So that's cool. Then we want to divide by the derivative of the bottom here. So we're going to do 1 over and then 2 times the derivative of n to the negative 1 will be negative n to the negative 2, just like that. So this is our new limit after doing L'Hopital's rule. 
what we can do now is bring this n to the negative 2 up to the top here. So it becomes multiplying by n to the positive 2, n squared. So we can get rid of this down here. And then what happens if we distribute this n squared through the top? Well, we're going to get the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 over n squared times n squared is just negative 1. And then negative 2 over n cubed times n squared is minus 2 over n. Then we have divided by this negative 2 factor out here, 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. Now what happens as n approaches infinity? Well, 2 over n goes to 0, 1 over n goes to 0, 1 over n squared goes to 0. So all we're going to be left with is negative 1 over negative 2, which is equal to 1 half. So that's our limit. But this limit, remember, is actually equal to the natural log of a. We want to find the original value of a, which means we do e to the power of both sides. So our final answer, a, is equal to e to the 1 half, or the square root of e. So that's our first limit. Now it's time to work on the second one. So I've cleared the board again, written the result for our first limit right here, and now it's time to do the second limit, which will be a lot easier. So you have the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n over 2. And now notice that we have n over 2 as the power. We could write that as n times 1 half. And what we can do is break up the powers. So we write this as 1 plus 1 over n to the n, and then raised to the power of 1 half. So that way, we multiply these powers together and get the correct result. But before I said the limit of a natural log is equal to the natural log of the limit, we can actually do the same thing with this. The limit of a 1 half power is also equal to the 1 half power of the limit. So we can take this all the way to the outside. And notice, what do we have left in the limit? The limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. Well, what is that equal to? That's equal to e, by definition. And then we have e to the 1 half power. That's equal to the square root of e. So our second limit is once again equal to the square root of e. So we're left with, we know that l is less than or equal to this limit. So it's less than or equal to the square root of e. We also know it's greater than or equal to the other limit, which is equal to the square root of e. So l must be between square root of e and square root of e which means we have conclusively established that our limit is equal to the square root of e. Now remember the key insight that got us closer to solving this problem was looking at this limit, seeing that it looked very similar to the limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the n, and thinking about how we can multiply some of these different factors together to get it into a form that's easier to evaluate and get our answer just like this.